Hello, my name is Maria Helena Carey. I run a blog called The Hill is Home, which focuses on Ward 6, but as a public service, we are uh, interviewing at large candidates and we teamed up with CHAMPS, the, the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce. And so, um, Julie, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Julie Aronson, and I'm the Executive Director of CHAMPS, Capitol Hill's Chamber of Commerce. Our mission is to advocate, promote, and uh, generally support our small businesses here on Capitol Hill. Okay, thank you. And today we are with Chander J. Raman. Um, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chander J. Raman. Uh, I currently serve as ANC Commissioner uh, on ANC 6B. I'm a vice chair. Uh, I've been on the ANC for eight years. A uh, little background about me. I was born in India, grew up in a suburb of Kansas City, uh, called, uh, and then uh, moved out here in 95. I've lived here longer than anywhere else. Um, my parents brought us to this country so that we would have opportunities that we wouldn't have there. And uh, uh, I've been able to do that. I've, I've uh, done a lot of uh, variety of things, including being a small business owner and uh, working currently in the field of emergency preparedness. So uh, very timely and very crucial. And uh, so grateful that my parents gave me the opportunity. And I see that uh, now is the time for me to pay it forward. Okay. Well. Thank you, and thank you so much for um, being here and for answering our questions. So the first question that I have is, um, in such a crowded field of candidates, how do you plan to stand out? Um, and do you think that because there are 25 candidates in the large race, um, does that mean better known names have an unfair advantage? Um, how about, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Yeah, it is a very, very crowded field, and I think it's for a variety of reasons. One is that, um, you know, there was um, an open seat that made it uh, increase the numbers. Then you have uh, additionally the lowering of the number of people you need to qualify, or petition signatures you need to qualify. I think that increased the field. Um, I think what st I stand out is that I'm a true independent. I didn't switch parties uh, in order for it to run, to run uh, for the at-large seat, and that's what uh, every other candidate in this race has done. Uh, I bring a very independent, common sense approach uh, to how I view things, how I've done business uh, on ANC 6B, and I think that's the kind of uh, new way of thinking we need. Um, you know, what has worked in the past, given what's going on now and how we're going to emerge out of this, really can't, we can't just rely on going back to the way it was because the way it was didn't work anyway. So let's reimagine how we're going to do business um, and how we're going to help people. And that's what I've done uh, all my life, whether it was working uh, at the Latin American Youth Center, running a youth build program for young people who dropped out of school, advocating for people with disabilities and seniors, uh, and now uh, helping with emergency preparedness. Uh, I helped finalize the current pandemic flu plan that the city operates under, uh, also the Office of State Superintendent Intended of education, uh, the plan that they're using for child care centers is the one I wrote. And so I have expertise in the field and I think I'm the right person at the right time uh, for this office. And uh, that's how I stand out. And, uh, and, I, and I've always been known for producing results. So. Okay. Um, can I just ask you uh, really briefly, what do you mean by a true independent? Because that's obviously your campaign motto. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, true independent means is that uh, I don't, uh, re re you know, necessarily have to respond to every, uh, you know, constituency that uh, are supporting me. So yesterday was a great example. Uh, one of the council members on the budget hearing, you know, got an email from us, uh, from an organization, and that person literally read the email and said, "Oh, they're against this now, so I have to be against it." What's your reaction? So. It's very much a reactionary type legislature that we have. And I think that's not a way to govern. You know, I think we really need to think through as a body, what does the future look like? What does it look like five years from now? And how do we get there? And so while COVID-19 has kind of changed a lot of things, it also presents a great opportunity to really think ahead and say, okay, we know we're in this crisis, we're reacting to it. Uh, but what does the future look like and how do we get there uh, in a uniform way, in, in a more thoughtful manner? 
Okay, thank you. Um, my next question actually has a little bit of to do with what you just said. Um, so each ward council office handles uh, services for their constituents in a geographical basis, but the at-larges have pretty much the entire uh, DC area. Um, how do you see at an out-large office that is more than just perceived as backup? Um, how would you raise the profile of that office so people know that they can go directly to you and, you know, not necessarily go always directly to their board council member that you're on their side? Yeah, I think uh, right now what you have is, is the at-large rate, at-large seat is supposed to represent everybody and their different constituencies. So I think we're really unique in Ward 6 in that we're kind of where the melting pot of, of West and East. And I think it gives me a very unique perspective. We are probably the most diverse ward in the entire city. And that a lot of the issues that we face here and that we've addressed on ANC 6B are similar challenges that, um, that occur in other wards. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can represent the entire city. Top that off with my direct experience working uh, with inner city kids, uh, being a small business owner, and um, you know, uh, having a work directly with uh, some of the young people in my neighborhood, that gives me a new perspective. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that the at-large uh, seat never does is constituent services. Okay. And I think it's sorely missing. And people call me all the time, hey Chandra, how do you do this? Well, I want to do continue to do that as an at large council member. I want to be the one you can turn to and say, hey, how do I help fix this? In the process of helping you get answers and get solutions so you can get things done, I will form a repository of answers. And it'll also provide us with an insight into where are things not working? Where are things falling short in the bureaucracy that we have? And we can fix that legislatively. So I'm going to turn it over now to Julie. Uh, go ahead, Julie. Thanks, Chandra, for joining us today. Um, this segues into one of the questions that I had. Um, one of the common concerns raised by CHAMPS members is that it's hard to do business in DC. Licensing is hard, the bureaucracy is slow, and agency databases don't seem to talk to each other. Um, many small business owners spend a lot of time navigating the DC bureaucracy. Um, and some of them have said to me that they could never have started their business without the support of a partner working full time because of the time and resources that it took them as an individual to get their business started. Um, this definitely hurts prospective small business owners who may not be well resourced. So how would you use your position on the council to make small business ownership easier and more accessible? Okay, thank you for that question. And it's, it's very much, uh, you know, at the core of who I am. Uh, small businesses are really the engines of our economy. And that's true here in an industry where there's hospitality, tourism, that are taking huge hits. And uh, we need to make it easier for businesses to get started and, and to survive and to succeed. Uh, what happens in the city government right now is that all these different agencies work in silos. They work independently of each other and they really don't wanna hear what another agency says. And they, um, when you have that kind of track, what it forces everyday residents and businesses to do is have to go down every tunnel in order to get things done. You know, though we've, you know, a great example is you can submit one document one place, but then you're resubmitting the exact same document to a sister agency over here. Why can't they not talk in the background? It's because they are forced to work in silos and they're ordered to you know, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Just do your job, do this little niche. And that doesn't serve anybody. All that does is fragments it. It duplicates uh, effort on the part of our businesses. And it's redundant on the government side. We have to make it easier for people to get a business license, to get the clean hands. And we have to do more to say, okay, we're going to do this for you. We're going to make your life easier. And that's not what it does. Right now, government is a hurdle to be overcome, not a partner for success. Great. Thank you. Um, as we're in this pandemic right now, um, we've entered into phase two and businesses are reopening, but sales for many of those businesses are 40% or greater low what they were this time last year. Um, fixed costs of rent and taxes are still due. 
and um, paycheck protection funds and the DC microgrant funds are running out. Many businesses have already used those funds up now. Uh, so if you are on the council right now, what are some of the proposals that you would put forward to help our small businesses continue to operate and employ people? Yeah, uh, thank you for, my, for that question. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think some of the things is, is that when you have, uh, you know, revenues that are down and then uh, you have sales that are barely starting to creep up, if at all. Uh, I think that's the last time you want to you want to put on a tax increase. And that's what was just considered um, the other day. And I don't think it's the right time to do that. Now, on the other hand, um, there are some opponents who want to say, hey, let's just drain all our reserves and um, that'll be the solution to it and not spend it on any business. What this COVID-19 has really taught us is hit all sides, all sectors, uh, workforce as well as industry and businesses. And only if we can lift them both up at the same time, and they're very much interdependent. If you don't have businesses, you're not gonna have jobs. And if, you, if people, workers don't feel safe, businesses are gonna suffer because um, their employees are not gonna wanna come back. So it has to be a union. And I think there is a middle ground where both sides can be lifted up, uh, you know, and, and for success for both, both sides. Okay, thank you. Um, my last question is uh, regarding parking, residential <laughs> versus commercial parking on Capitol Hill um, and in many DC neighborhoods is a real flashpoint. Um, and it's this issue of how do you balance the needs of residents, of customers, of employees and employers, uh, particularly now during COVID. Um, so when parking is in high demand, a lot of times employees or um, DC service providers have to pro have to just accept that parking tickets are a part of doing business. Um, that's a part of their, that's just a, a fee that they have to pay. Um, so how would you approach this problem and kind of what are your thoughts behind it? Yeah, it's not, it's not an easy, so there's no easy solution to this. Uh, parking is always tight. Um, I think we're doing a better job of encouraging more people to uh, not use their cars and, um, but again, what you're, what's happening is people want to drive to restaurants. They don't feel comfortable going to uh, using the metro train or metro bus. And I think that's going to actually uh, grow because people are going to want not want to, they're worried about being contaminated or being exposed to COVID in a setting where cleaning only happens once a day. Um, you know, that's, that's not okay. So what's going to happen? People are going to drive in and they're going to park wherever they can. I think we've done a good job of setting aside one side of the street for uh, you know, residential only parking. And I think we can expand that, but still allow the other side um, for businesses and people who are guests and visiting that businesses need to come to our neighborhoods to be able to park on that side. Um, I think there's some, been some efforts now where limiting parking, so there's a lot more turnover uh, in terms of parking. Uh, with respect to employees, um, I would look for locations where they can be in, gathered together, meaning uh, on in Capitol Hill. I think uh, we should look at the parking lot under the Hind Building. There are 245 spots there. The market is not open all day long or all night long. I think there's a, a potentially there may be a way there. Looking at parking underneath the overpasses to convert those from, from just residential parking to more flexible parking that allows for uh, uh, individuals who are working in restaurants and bars, uh, particularly um, members of the Latino community who, uh, who are working in the kitchens and stuff and in the back of the shop and as busboys, that they need to have a safe way home. And I think we need to look at creative ways to, of finding more uh, congregate uh, parking. Um, the other one is maybe some of these businesses like the, um, like the bids and uh, main streets could find some sort of mechanism to be able to provide uh, a shuttle or use one of the mechanisms we have right now. We've got the circulator that goes right down 8th Street, that goes down Pennsylvania Avenue, we've got a Metro bus, um, you know, Particularly, the, I think the problem is really late night parking. And I think we can use that by allowing uh, workers to park there. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Well, so, and uh, finally, uh, the last question is a little lighthearted question. Um, what would you name the regional football team other than its temporary name, the Washington football team? And do you support it returning to RFK? Um, I'll take the second part first. Um, I don't support uh, our, the you know, football team returning to RFK. Uh, I think I, I, I would be fine with the Redskins coming back to DC. I'm not sure that's the right location. Uh, I think that uh, piece of land has a lot of opportunities for uh, amenities and for housing, particularly affordable housing and mixed use housing. It's on the waterfront. I think uh, that may not be the best place. I do think that there are some other areas over by where the other stadiums are, over by Nats, and Nats Park and uh, yeah, in that area. The reason is you can take advantage of the parking that's already exists there with between the baseball stadium and the soccer stadium. So you wouldn't need to build as much parking. Um, I'm not a, you know, I would say no to, uh, unless somebody can convince me that there's gonna be a smaller footprint, that we're not gonna have large open spaces of asphalt that are gonna be used for dumping snow uh, in the wintertime. That's the only thing it's used for now. Uh, if somebody can find a way to show me that there's an alternate, a better way of doing it, I'm open to listening. Uh, but right now, as it stands right now, I, I don't think the RFK uh, site is the best uh, location for a football stadium. Okay. And so uh, you like the name Washington football team for now then? Uh, you know, you look at all the broadcasters that, you know, they call us Washington. We are Washington, you know? So uh, I think it's, uh, it's an easy way. Like whenever you rebrand anything, I think it was more than many of the business owners know, it's not something you can do quickly. Uh, I think they're taking the right approach to finding a name that's gonna fit for everybody. I know that's kind of a cop out and saying, okay, what's my name, what, what I, would I pick? Um, you know, frankly, I haven't had a chance to give it a lot of thought about it. I am glad that, uh, that the, you know, the Redskins name has been retired. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with where they are today and, and I probably will have my opinions as some names get thrown around. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, everybody has an opinion for that, for sure. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, if you have any parting thoughts or if you have anything that where people want to reach you or learn more about your campaign, sure. um, and we'll make sure to add those links whenever this goes up, it'll be on YouTube and it'll be on Instagram video. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, my website is easy, chander2020.com, um, and go to that to find more information about me. Our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles are chander, the number four, council, and uh, that's how you can connect with me. You know, what's interesting about this race is that uh, Ward 6 is going to be very, very critical in deciding the at-large race. I'm the only candidate in the race that's from Ward 6, that's from the Hill, that understands the Hill, and um, I think there is one issue that nobody really has thought about, which is redistricting. And uh, uh, we are posed to get chopped up. And uh, I understand it, I see it coming. And um, I'm, I'm probably the only candidate who has a stake in making sure that uh, Ward 6 remains as whole as possible. Okay, well, thank you. Anything else to add, Julie? Thank you very much for being here with us. We appreciate it. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. Great to see you all. Thanks, good to see you.